Hi, this is Candy Cushman, host of the Speak Up Virginia radio show, and I have a special message for you. Can you believe summer is already over and we are hurtling into the fall season? That involves November elections, so we thought it would be a good time to re-air our episode addressing why Christians should care about the upcoming elections for governor, lieutenant governor, and many other offices. So join with us as we revisit how biblical values connect to our elections. Some people say they'd love to have the Christmas season all year long, but nobody says that about election season. And yet here in Virginia, it seems like politics just keep starting earlier and going longer. You may have already noticed the political ads appearing on your television screens and social media feeds. But why should Christians care about all this? And what role does the church have to play in the election process? Welcome to Speak Up Virginia, equipping you to speak up on the life, family, and freedom issues that matter most to you. From the Family Foundation, I'm your host, Candy Cushman, and I'm joined today by our president, Victoria Cobb. Well, before we get started today, I have to mention that a rare thing happened here at the Family Foundation, and that is that our president, Victoria, actually took a real vacation, meaning there actually were some emails that you didn't respond to, which is a rare phenomenon that I've really not observed since I've been here. So how did that go? Were you able to actually unplug and create some fun memories with your family? Yeah, we had a great vacation, and um, I think everybody looks forward to that time at the beach, you know, where you can just relax. And I did try to put some boundaries around around not, you know, doing the usual thing with emails, but our kids loved it. And, um, you know, honestly, for our family, it's a victory if we just um, are actually enjoy the entire vacation. We did have one on record where we actually did that terrible parent thing where you literally cut your vacation short because your kids are not behaved well. So we have have done some pretty dramatic things. This was a great one. Our kids were um, just enjoying everything. Um, and we had our usual annual putt-putt uh, tournament. You know, our family is pretty competitive. We have had to actually stop scoring that, though. We just literally uh, hope that everybody gets a hole-in-one now to try to <laughs> decrease the competitive nature of our kids. Well, today's topic is about another phenomenon that we've observed, and that is that the election season in Virginia feels like it never ends. I mean, one thing I had to get used to when I moved here is that our state never really has an off season with this stuff. It, it always seems like there's some kind of primary or political race happening, right? Yeah, and it can be so easy to just tune, try to tune it all out, put your head in the sand and hope it all goes away. But we really, as Christians, can't do that. We have to stay engaged. It is necessary that we stay alert and we know who the candidates are and we make wise choices when we get to the ballot box. That's just part of our calling. But in Virginia, especially because we have this year's a huge election – Right after we had a huge election last year, right? The whole country had a huge election for the president last year, but we turn around and elect our big statewide offices the very next year. Well, let's talk about that a little bit and how it's going to have a huge impact on families and people of faith. So let's just start with the governor's race. Well, the governor's race in Virginia is historically important because, first of all, it is that first election after the president. And I mentioned that earlier, but the important part about that is it's really become a bellwether or sort of a referendum on how is the president doing. If people are happy, they might elect the same party. If they're not, they make a reactionary choice in our governor's race. So it's kind of a cue to the rest of the nation, and they look at it as they think about their congressional races the next year. But also, uh, more and more, we're seeing governors have power. They have executive power. We saw it in uh, in just tremendous ways during the pandemic, whether it's shutdowns with churches or you name it. And so people are really starting to become aware that governors are important. They also, in Virginia particularly, have heavy, heavy appointment power. This came into play. They make all these boards and, and commissions, and those people, people call it the deep state or whatever, but they, they make a lot of policies. They did on our abortion center stuff. And when people right now are battling with universities over vaccines, for example, and the, our state universities requiring kids to have vaccines, and there's some folks that object, that's because the board of visitors are making those decisions. They're elected by the governor. You know, we see this model by the president. It's like the governors are replicating it, that they are doing more and more through these emergency executive orders that do impact families and schools. Yeah, I think we're seeing governors push the envelope. So there are big budget line items, and they get to decide what to do with the contracts, right? So now we're funding the abortion industry. Same issue. That's a choice of the governor. The governor, the, the General Assembly sets some, you know, goal of this is what we think is important. Like, it could be uh, pregnancy-related things. And then the governor decides where that goes, and this governor says, let's send that all to Planned Parenthood. Well, let's quickly move on to these other two top state offices. First of all, we've got the lieutenant governor's office. Why should people care about 
that office. In Virginia, our lieutenant governor breaks a tie in the Senate. They preside over the Senate, and if our Senate, which is 40 people, is 2020 on an issue, they'll tie break. And we have seen that on some huge issues because our Senate is so close right now. So we watched this current lieutenant governor make a tie-breaking vote fast-forwarding the marijuana issue for Virginia. That was entirely one position that moved that ball forward. And we've seen it on the pro-life legislation where our, our Senate is basically 2020 on the life issue. It really is almost any life bill that got to the Senate would probably break 2020 and leave that in the hands of lieutenant governor. So it's critically important that we elect a pro-life lieutenant governor if we expect to see pro-life policy. Um, well, let's talk about the office of the attorney general. It's becoming more clear, isn't it, that especially in the last few years, how this office can really be used for good or evil, especially when it comes to family values. Yeah, we want to believe that the attorney general's office is this great neutral arbiter of justice that defends what the people do here in Virginia. But we've seen that that's not always the case. And so what we found is that sometimes if you elect the, the wrong attorney general, they can really be part of the attack on religious freedom and pro-family issues. We also have seen that they've expanded, the current attorney general has expanded things like the human rights division with the intention of going after churches that might have different ideology on sexual orientation or gender identity. And so you sit there and think, wow, we really have in that one office the power to um, help or hurt. Thanks for tuning in if you're just now joining us for Speak Up Virginia, brought to you by the Family Foundation. For more information about us or the topics we're addressing, you can visit familyfoundation.org. That's familyfoundation.org. Well, we also can't neglect to mention that come this November, Virginians are going to elect a brand new House of Delegates. That's 100 seats, right? Yeah, and the House of Delegates is so important because they're, this is the largest, uh, you know, basically you're electing 100 people across the state of Virginia. So these are the people that are closest to your community's needs. And so this is an incredibly important group of people. And also the fact that I already mentioned, when our Senate is so narrowly divided, the makeup of the other chamber becomes incredibly important because you need both to pass something and you need one of them to stop something. Well, there are also several key issues impacting families right now that ultimately are going to hinge on the makeup of the new General Assembly. So let's just talk about redefinition of marriage, for example. Tell us how the delegates are important to that. Well, yes, I, I mentioned that there's a marriage amendment that went into our Constitution years and years ago that put a traditional definition of marriage in. It was struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court, and so we've been basically as functioning as if same-sex marriage were uh, the practice in Virginia. And our legislature decided that they're going to repeal and replace that. And they're going to put in language that says that we're going to honor and respect sort of any kind of marriage between any kind of parties. Didn't even limit it to two people. So we're, we're talking about a radical redefinition. But the important part and where the House comes in is they're part of passing it the first time, but there's an election. And whenever you change the Constitution, you actually have to pass it twice with an election in between. So they passed it. We'll decide in November what the House of Delegates looks like. And then that new group will come back and they have to pass it verbatim for that to go to the people. So they have the power to stop this radical redefinition of marriage. Well, we have a similar situation with the commercialization of marijuana. Now, They've already gotten approval for legalizing small amounts of when it comes to possession. But as far as full-fledged commercialization, that's the kind of thing with a pot shop around every corner, you know, um, that has to be reauthorized as well by the General Assembly. Yeah, the main thing that became law in July was simply someone possessing a small amount of marijuana. The whole sort of turning ourselves into what we've seen in Colorado, all of that is yet to be decided. Those details will come down to the next General Assembly. And so it's incredibly important that we weigh these things when we hit the ballot box, that we want to know where these candidates stand on exactly the issues that we know are going to be in front of them. Well, clearly there's a lot of prayer that needs to surround this election, but we also need to be educating our neighbors, and we've got some handy tools for doing that, right? Uh, tell us, for example, about the report card that we're putting out. Yeah, I mean, we always put out a report card, and that's simply saying this is your current legislative group, this is the House of Delegates and the Senate, how they've already voted over the last couple of years on life and marriage issues. So if you see the way they voted, you can guess how they're going to vote in the future. And if they aren't voting your way, then you need to make an alternate choice. So if people want to access that resource, it is available right now. Just go to our website, familyfoundation.org, and look for the report card banner that's up there right now. 
Well, you know, a lot of people have also expressed concern, and for good reason, I think, about the changes that have recently been made in our state voting laws, like no longer requiring the voter ID or loosening up the early voting regulations. Yeah, there have been a lot of concerns around the changes in our election law, and for a lot of folks, they're troubling. But the bottom line is, there's a silver liner, and that is that Christians and churches can benefit from these changes, that we can take advantage of them, that we should make sure we consider voting whenever we're ready, whenever we know what decisions we're going to make. Let's get that done and not wait till the last second in case something happens, like a pandemic we learned last time, you know, that, that things can affect showing up at the ballot box. Well, what about churches? How can they get involved in just educating their members about registering to vote and obtaining absentee ballots? Yeah, it's perfectly appropriate for a church to say this is your biblical engagement responsibility and encourage people to get registered to vote. They can actually have registration opportunities in their in their service or in their back lobby. And honestly, the way voting laws have changed, there's a lot that can be done by actually uh, getting absentee ballots out to your congregation and getting them turned in. So it's a different world, let's put it that way, but uh, we ought to encourage churches to take advantage of where we are to make sure that their voices, as you said, are heard. It's really about education, and there's nothing to stop churches from doing nonpartisan education, how to register people to vote so Christians actually have a voice, and how to take advantage of the new voting law so they can be proactive. Um, So again, you just want to go to our website, get that report card right now, and watch for the voter guides, which are also coming out in September. Well, it's that time again, time for our Inconceivable Moments Award, where we're featuring examples of the absolute lunacy and craziness that happens when cultural leaders try to give guidance completely apart from biblical principles. And we're calling this the Liberals' Most Inconceivable Moments Award. Inconceivable! In case we didn't already know that children are no longer safe from these adult agendas being pushed on them every second of the day, basically, whether it's through LGBT lessons on cereal boxes or drag queen story hour in the libraries, now we have yet another reminder that kids have become really a free-for-all target for political agendas. Yeah, this time we have a proposal for a new children's book called What's an Abortion Anyway? And yes, you did hear me say that correctly. We now have a book trying to be published that actually promotes abortion to kids. This is disturbing on so many levels. First of all, The authors say that their goal in doing this book is to present a perspective, quote, where abortion is normalized as another outcome of pregnancy, unquote. But obviously an elective abortion, as opposed to a medical miscarriage, for example, that's in no way a normal, natural outcome for pregnancy. Absolutely not. And I will tell you that every time I hear that word normalization, the first thing I think is violation of innocence. Every time they try to normalize some adult behavior in children, all they're doing is violating innocence. And it is a shocker and it is incredibly disappointing. And I can tell you from when I told my daughter the first time about abortion, it is a shock to a child's system to think a mother could take the life of their own own child. It's it's stunning. And to think we should normalize that, it's, it's a shocker. Well, I think it's also important to mention that the creators of this book say they are raising more than 20000 online toward publishing it and for distributing it to libraries nationwide. But I love what our friend John Stone Street said in his commentary. He said if abortion is just another outcome of pregnancy, then why is it requiring a $20,000 pretty much propaganda effort to normalize it? Yeah, that is so true. I mean, when you think about it, despite 40 plus years of legalized abortion and billions of dollars being spent on the, by the abortion industry to try to basically create a whole propaganda fundraising campaign and then to have this one on top of it to try to say that if this thing is normal, maybe we should realize that our conscience is trying to tell us something. And I think it's a good perspective to keep in mind that We have a timeless message that stays the same for our kids, and that is that they are known and loved by God even before birth, and that their life is important in God's eyes. And so we just need to remember that and continue that message. But I guess this week's Inconceivable Award definitely has to go to the authors and promoters of the children's book, What's an Abortion Anyway?, and their propaganda effort to convince kids that abortion is a good thing. Thanks for joining us for this week's Speak Up Virginia, brought to you by the Family Foundation. Visit us at familyfoundation.org. That's familyfoundation.org. See you next time. And don't forget, we are stronger when we speak together.